Hi, in today's video, we are going to talk about NP a little bit more. Um, we introduced the idea of the NP class last time. Now we're going to see how do we really prove that something is a member of NP, meaning how do we prove a problem is an NP problem, and then also about what does that mean and uh, how this connects to, I guess, how you could win a million dollars. Um, so just as a reminder, this is the formal de definition of the NP complexity class, um, and it and it says that uh, a problem is in NP if there are short certificates and fast verifiers for that problem. Okay, so let's let's be concrete with this now. Let's think about a couple specific problems. So the vertex cover problem, here's the decision version of it. Does G have a vertex cover with at most K vertices? Uh, first, we should say, just as a reminder, this is really part of the problem itself, but what's the size of this problem um, is N squared where n is the number of vertices, because that's the size of this graph. And notice that k, the second input, is definitely smaller than n, um, so that's fine. So we can say the whole size of this is n squared, and so that's what our target is, polynomial in n. So the certificate for this is just going to be a proposed vertex cover. So let's be specific about what that is. The certificate will be a list of vertices that um, with size less than k, at most k, that is a valid vertex cover. Okay, and then the size of this certificate is clearly big O of n, because there's n vertices in the whole thing, so there's less than or equal to n vertices in a valid certificate. That's important, because for some problems, um, it's like, in a weird way possible to verify it if you could have a certificate that's like exponentially large. Um, like if you could imagine like listing out all possible vertex covers, uh, that really wouldn't make sense as a, as a fast verification. Okay, so that's the certificate size, that's good. Um, and the verifier algorithm, this is usually the part out of all this that is the least obvious or, or might require some thinking. Um, and, and some, some care. It's not too hard in this case. We just have to be really careful about what it means to not get fooled. So we want to really distrust the certificate. Um, and uh, so we, we need to check everything about it. So we need to check every vertex is actually in the graph G. So we're given a list of vertices, make sure they're all legit vertices in the graph. And then what we want to do is for every edge in G, um, we want to make sure that it's covered by one of the vertex vertices in the covered. So for every edge in G, and then um, check that one endpoint of G is in the certificate. And then that's it. And so now think about what's the cost of this algorithm. Uh, oh, sorry, I, I forgot to say one other thing. So we have to check that every vertex is in G and that the length is less than or equal to K. Um, sometimes you might say like this is implied by the definition of the certificate, but that's just important to say that we check it. So we're, you know, if somebody gives you a vertex cover that has like all of the vertices, you want to make sure that that gets rejected by your verification algorithm. Okay, so now what's the cost of this? So this first check, um, we're, we're never trying to do things too cleverly. So you can frequently like think of how to do these verifications like a little bit better if you use a hash table or if you use something else. Um, but here we only care about polynomial time, which means that any lookups we want to do, just look it up by iterating over the whole list. Um, because we don't care about the running time as long as it's polynomial. So like checking every vertex, whether it's actually in G, you could imagine that's like a nested loop of saying for every vertex in the given vertex cover, I loop through all the vertices in the graph and check whether it matches. So that's like an n squared loop. Um, so I would say like n squared for that first part. Plus for this one, um, every edge in G, well, there's n squared edges at most. And then we check one endpoint of G is in the certificate. So that means that for this inner check, we have to loop through all of the vertices in the cover. There's a most n of those. So we have like n squared to go through every edge and n to check each edge. And so that's going to be a total of like n cubed, which is a total of uh, n cubed. So we have like an n squared for the first check, n cubed for the second check, and that's n cubed overall, which is polynomial time in the original input size of n squared. Again, could you do this verification faster? You certainly could. 
Um, but it does not matter because I just want to emphasize what these like reductions is worth. The next thing we're going to look at and the certificates that we're looking at now with verification algorithms, it's really not an, it's an algorithm and we have to make sure that it's uh, efficient enough in terms of polynomial time, but there's no benefit to making it more efficient than that. Nobody's ever actually going to run this algorithm. It's only used to prove that this, um, this problem is in this certain complexity class of NP. So we're not, we're not uh, any, any kind of like low level optimization to make this be N squared log N instead of N cubed or something is going to just make it more complicated and not have any benefit at all. Um, so it's, it's kind of a fun opportunity to be lazy of just like, oh yeah, everything I want to check, I just loop through the whole list. Um, so if you, so, so just take it as that uh, you have to like resist your now well-trained instincts to optimize everything and make it faster. As long as it's polynomial time, that's going to be good enough. Okay. So this proves that vertex cover problem is a member of NP. And again, emphasizing that a lot of these things are kind of obvious. Um, but that doesn't mean that there's not some specific things we need to write down. A lot of the challenge with these NP proofs and things is figuring out like where's the obvious thing and, and just writing down what that is and then focusing on the part that's a little bit more tricky. The only part that's a little tricky here is with the verification algorithm where we have to think of all of the ways in which um, the certificate that we're given could actually be invalid. Okay, let's think about the factorization problem. Um, does n have a prime factor less than k? So the certificate is going to be a factor of n between 2 and k minus 1. Right, so a factor of n that, so the answer to the yes, remember a certificate is proving that the answer is yes. So we will prove that the answer is yes if we have a factor of n that's within this range. Um, notice that I didn't say a prime factor here. That's going to help me later on. So if you think about it, if I have a factor that's not prime, then that thing itself must have a prime factor, right? Because that's the way that prime numbers work. If, if a number is not prime, then it must have some smaller prime factor than that. And so I can answer this original question by just having any factor at all. And what's the benefit of that simplification is it allows me to do the verification without having to check the number is actually prime. We could check the number is prime, but it's a little bit more sophisticated to do that in polynomial time. Um, the Miller-Rabin algorithm, if you remember, is a randomized algorithm, so that wouldn't really fit into the rules here. Um, and so that's, I can simplify this in this case to just say, give me any factor. I'm not going to check if it's prime. Um, and so that simplifies the verification later. So that's like a small example, but a small example of things where like, if you simplify the certificate as much as you can, then that can make your work easier. The certificate size in this case, um, this is always about the size, so about the bit size of things. And so how big is this going to be? It's going to be log of n. Why log of n? Because any factor, it has to be less than n. And so I can write it down with log of n bits. Remember, um, we're talking about the size, not the value of that number. And that's important because the original input size is also log of capital N log the number of bits in n itself so that's important that this is like polynomial size in the original one the verification algorithm is i'm, I'm going to check whether it's actually a factor um so if so let's say if the certificate has uh integer d then compute n modulo d and return yes if n mod d equals zero. So we just check whether it's actually a factor. We do the division with remainder and, and say, yes, it's a factor if that remainder is zero. Um, and then we should say we also check that two is less than or equal to d, which is less than or equal to k minus one. So we should also check that it's actually within the correct range. Again, we want to make sure that somebody can't just like put one down as a certificate and then that would seem to verify because one is a factor of everything, but it wouldn't actually prove something about this being a prime factor. And what's the cost of this? It's really just the cost of doing this mod, which uh, we haven't carefully said why this is the case, but, but basically doing a mod is the same cost as doing a, a multiplication. And so you could use a more complicated algorithm like Karatsubas to make this be log of n to the 1.59, but there's no reason to do that because we can just use the classic one 
that has n squared running time, uh, sorry, log of n squared running time, like in terms of the number of bits, quadratic num uh, running time. And that simpler way is going to be good enough to show that this is polynomial time. Okay, so again, the idea here is how do we prove that, you know, this thing exists is you, your certificate, you just say, show it to me. And then um, the verification is, is checking that it's actually valid and, and it fulfills the requirements. And so this, uh, this now leads us to really say what is this big question that's driving the, this whole unit and actually drives a lot of current research um, into computational complexity and computer science theory is a question of does P equal NP? Um, so the, the class P, just remember, what does that mean? So P means you can solve it quickly. And NP means you can check it quickly. And those two things seem to be different from each other, right? It seems that there's a lot of problems like vertex cover where you can quickly check the answer or like a traveling salesman problem type thing. You can check a potential solution, but it's really hard to actually come up with that. That's what it seems like. Um, and so it seems like this is the case that those two groups are not equal to each other. But very interestingly, we, we don't have any proof of that. Um, so it could be the case that P equals NP, meaning that all of these problems that we can check quickly, that somehow we can also solve them quickly, even though we haven't, no one has, has found um, algorithms to do that. Another way of phrasing this is like, is guess and check ever the best that we can do, right? So if if NP is not equal to P, that means that kind of the best we can do to solve those problems is some exponential search, like a guess and check type thing. Um, but if P equals NP, then that would mean that guess and check is never the best algorithm. There's always some more clever way to do it. Um, and so nobody knows the answer to this question right now. Most people suspect that P is not equal to NP. Um, and by people, I don't mean like random person on the street, but uh, there's like some surveys of people that work in computer science. And most people, maybe around 90%, I think, that work on these questions uh, say, it seems like all the evidence points to P not equal NP, but we don't have any proof of that yet. So what would you need to prove this one way or another is to prove that P is equal to NP, you would have to um, say that every uh, NP problem, so every problem that can be quickly checked, has a polynomial time solution. That seems really hard to do, although we'll see in, in the next part, once we get into reductions in NP completeness, that, that this task might not be as hard as it seems. But um, yeah, so that's what we would need to prove that these are the same. And what we would need to prove that they're not the same, which seems like, you know, should be on the horizon, is just that any, so a single NP problem, like the hardest NP problem, um, has no polynomial time solution. And just to be clear, what does it mean to say has no? Not just that we haven't come up with it. There's a number of NP problems that um, we, nobody's come up with a polynomial time solution. You know, uh, vertex cover and factorization both fit that bill. They are problems that are definitely in NP. We just proved it. Nobody knows any polynomial time algorithms for those. Um, but that doesn't mean that there isn't one. It might just mean that we haven't found it yet. We haven't figured it out yet. Uh, so if you could take any NP problem, just one, and prove that that one definitely can't be solved in polynomial time, then that would mean that P is not equal to NP. Um, but nobody knows whether that's uh, the case or not. And just to show you, um, this is the website of the Clay Math Institute, which is they run some workshops and, and sponsor some grad students, but mostly they're well known for these, um, what they call the millennium problems. There's a history of these. So these were announced in 2000 as like, here's the problems that we should work on in this new millennium. Um, and it kind of goes along. There was a very uh, famous mathematician named David Hilbert that announced in 1900 um, his problems that he thought that people should work on and solve in the next 100 years from 1900 to 2000. And a number of those problems were actually solved or the ones that weren't sometimes created whole new fields of investigation. And so I think they were trying to go along with that, that idea. 
And what's interesting is that, so these are like pretty mathematical problems, most of them, but the P versus NP problem is clear within computer science. Um, and I'll point out that only one of these has been solved so far. So these each carry a million dollar prize for the first person who comes up with a solution. The only one that's been solved so far is the Poincaré conjecture. And uh, it was solved in, uh, I think, 2000, around 2005, 2003, 2005, by a Russian mathematician named Gregory Perelman. And um, this guy is kind of a recluse, so it's uh, interesting to read about him. He was the first person to solve this million, one of these million dollar prizes. He declined the award. Um, he said, I don't deserve it. And he said, I don't want to be put like an animal in the zoo and kind of like stop, stop asking me questions. And I think he doesn't work on mathematics anymore. So that's kind of sad, but I hope he's doing well. And uh, the P versus NP problem is the one that has the most interest for computer science. And um, there's a nice description here. I encourage you to go look at it. It's, it's a nice write-up and some related links here that talks about what this problem is, is really asking us. Um, and now we know what this problem is at a technical level. We still have no idea how to solve it. Um, so the last thing I wanted to mention in today's video is just what is NP? So the real meaning of this name is non-deterministic polynomial time. So it's kind of like um, you know applying this non-deterministic label to a Turing machine. So polynomial time technically means anything that can be solved in polynomial time by a Turing machine. And so NP means something that can be solved in polynomial time by a non-deterministic Turing machine. So what does that mean? Remember the difference from your theory class between like DFAs and NDFAs. The distinction is in a non-deterministic finite automaton, um, you can have multiple transitions with the same uh, symbol. Right, so there's kind of like multiple paths, and you have to figure out, is there any path that leads to an accepting state for this input? Okay, so that's um, DFAs and NDFAs. Uh, but now applying that to a Turing machine is a little bit more weird, but you can imagine as a Turing machine with a state and like multiple transitions with the same state. So let me, um, let me show a little bit of a picture of what I'm talking about. Um, so polynomial time means if we're thinking about it in terms of a Turing machine, we have this input tape that has like the input. So this is maybe describing a graph and uh, integer k, and we want to know does there exist a vertex cover of size less than k. So this is the input to the problem. And a polynomial time algorithm means you have to be able to take that input and always produce the right answer. If the real answer is yes, you have to produce the answer yes. If the real answer is no, you always have to produce no. Um, so now let's think about what does NP mean. So let me make a new part to this picture. I'll put it down here. So NP means non-deterministic polynomial time, like we said. And what happens here is that we need not just the input. So what does the verification algorithm take? It takes the input to the original problem, like it takes the graph for vertex cover, but it also takes something else. The verification algorithm also needs the certificate. So it needs this second part, this second component, which is uh, which is a certificate for a yes answer. So we have like the original input to the problem, and then we have some additional bits on the tape, which is a uh, a proposed certificate, a potential certificate. And what does it mean to say that we have a verifier? Well, if the correct answer is no, meaning if the input really doesn't have a vertex cover of that size, if the number that we're trying to factor really doesn't have a factor of that size, then this should still answer no. Meaning if the, if the real answer is no to the problem, then no certificate should be able to prove to you the answer is yes. So the verifier should always say no, whenever the real answer is no. So that part is actually the same. The difference is now, if the correct answer is yes, the verifier doesn't always output yes. What does it take for the verifier to output yes is it has to have a valid certificate. So if the correct answer is yes, um, the verifier has to output yes for at least one certificate. Right, so what does it mean for a problem to be an NP is that just one certificate has to exist. 
So there's some setting of these bits besides the input that will like convince the verifier to output yes. So the difference is kind of like, instead of just having the input, we have these extra bits of information and there just has to be one special way of setting these that if the true answer is yes, it'll convince the verifier to answer yes. But if the true answer is no, the verifier always outputs no. Okay, so that's NP. And one thing that I think is interesting and just because it relates to some of my own like research work, so I'm, I'm kind of uh, forcing it on you, is to think about there's, there's a third class which is kind of in between these. It's called RP and this is uh, random. Random polynomial time. And so what that means is that these extra bits that we get, um, they're not a certificate, but you can think of these as the like extra random bits that would go along within with an algorithm. So like the random coin flip results. Okay, and what is a random polynomial time algorithm? How does that need to work? Well, like the Miller-Rabin algorithm, the question that you're asking would be a compositeness check. So the Miller-Rabin algorithm would be asking, is this number composite? So if it's really no, that always outputs no. And the, the distinction is that um, if it really is composite, then it what's the rule for a random algorithm is that it has to output yes for half of the random um, choices. So in other words, the, the official rule for like a random polynomial time algorithm is that it gets the, the answer right a fraction of the time. So maybe for like half of the possible random inputs, it's gonna give you the correct answer. Um, but for the other half, uh, it might give you the wrong answer. But if, if the true answer is the other way, then it'll always output the right thing. So that's kind of like, um, yeah, the, the best example we've seen of that is the Miller-Raven algorithm, which for numbers that are really prime always gives you the right answer. But for numbers that are not really prime, it might give you the right answer or not. And that's why we have to run it again and again. But you can kind of put it within this same um, category. So um, polynomial time is kind of like saying you always have to get the right answer. Randomized algorithms are, are kind of like saying you get these extra bits, these extra inputs, which aren't from your computational process, but in this case are random. And for most of those extra inputs, a randomized algorithm has to give the right answer. And an NP like verifier algorithm has to also take these extra bits, but has to only give the correct answer for one very specific um, setting of those. And so there's actually interesting work. I said that it's a million dollars to know whether P is equal to NP. RP is something that's in between these. And what's interesting, why, why it's interesting to me, and I like to think about this in my research, is that, um, and to be clear, I haven't made much like progress towards answering this question, but I think it's an interesting uh, thing to think about of we have something in between and it's much less known. So most people don't believe that P is equal to MP, but it's split about 50-50, it seems, between um, researchers of whether this middle of the road option, the random polynomial time algorithm. So the problems that we can solve uh, well with random information, whether those are actually all polynomial time. So whether there's always a fast deterministic algorithm to do the same thing, maybe we haven't found it yet, but it always exists, or whether these are like actually not part of P, whether they're separated and they're like their own harder thing. Um, so whether there's a, a some problem that we can solve with random information that we couldn't solve efficiently without that random information. Nobody knows the answer to that question either. Um, uh, I think you would be fairly famous if you found an answer to that question, but you would not get a million dollars from the, the Clay Foundation. Uh, so that's the P versus NP question. Um, and again, there's this meaning of it, of thinking about Turing machines. The main way that we think about it is just uh, like in terms of this description on the, the Clay website is, uh, can you easily check it versus whether can you can easily compute it and knowing whether uh, those groups of problems are actually the same. So whether everything that you can easily check can always be easily computed or not. And so I'll set you to work on this one. Um, if you solve this problem, then you do get an automatic A in my class, as long as you make me a co-author on your paper uh, and you can keep the money. Okay. Um, thanks a lot. And I'll see you next time. Bye-bye.